Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is issue indivisibility. I cover this in Chapter 5 of The Rationality of War. You can check the video description below for more information about that. The big question we're interested in addressing today is how can bargaining indivisibilities lead to war? Remember that in our standard bargaining model, as long as the probability of victory is known by both sides and the costs of war are positive, then there exists a bargaining range, and any settlement that falls within that bargaining range is going to be mutually preferable to war. We would prefer to settle in a peaceful way within that bargaining range than fight a war against one another. However, we've assumed implicitly here that we're capable of dividing this good, whatever it is that we're bargaining over, we have assumed that we can divide it wherever we please. So I can take zero of it, or I can take half of it, I could take a third of it, I could take 0.446 of it, I could take 0.999 of it, or I could take everything. I could take any sort of division from this good and offer it to you and offer to keep the rest of it or demand to keep the rest of it for myself. However, that might not be a realistic possibility for some topics or some issues or some goods, and we are, refer to such goods as indivisible goods. So, for example, a king's ship might not really be effectively divisible. It's not like I can say, you know what, I'm going to offer you a deal. I'm going to be king on Mondays and Tuesdays, and you can be king the rest of the five days of the week. It's not really a practical possibility there. It's either I have to be king or you have to be king, and we can't really divide the time effectively. Control over an island might follow suit in that an island is pretty small, and so for practical reasons, I can't control the island or part of the island and also have you control part of the island. It really has to be either me controlling the entire thing or you controlling the entire thing. A national religion, if we're only going to have one of them, well, that's obviously indivisible. Holy sites could be indivisible if I only want to have the holy site to myself and you also find the site holy, so you actually want it as well, then there's pretty clearly going to be some conflict over that. And people, like Osama bin Laden, those guys are indivisible. It's not like Afghanistan could have chopped off bin Laden's head and sent it over to the United States without Afghanistan losing the value of Osama bin Laden because by losing his head, they lose him. So those types of things, you can't really bargain over. It's either I have to have it or you have to have it, and that's going to cause problems. So let's talk about this in context of control over an island. So again, we still see that the bargaining range is here, but we can't actually come up with an agreement that says we're going to divide it here or here or here or here. It either has to be that I control all of it or you control all of it. Now, if that's the case, so for example, suppose that I say you can control all of it and I'm over here. Should I want to fight over that or not? The answer is that I should want to fight over it. The reason is that if you're taking everything, then I'm getting nothing. But if I were to fight over it, then I could get 1 minus PA minus CB. That's my expected utility for fighting. And that's positive here. So my value for fighting is this red line. That's worth more than nothing to me. And so if you were to try to take control over the entire island, I would prefer fighting than letting you have it. But for the same reason, you would prefer fighting over letting me have the entire island. So if I controlled the entire island, then you would want to fight because your value for fighting is PA minus CA, and that's a positive amount, right? Your value for war is that the size of that red line, and that's more than nothing, so you would want to fight over it. And so as a result, we can't come up with an effective agreement that's going to satisfy both of us. Either you're going to want to control the entire island, or you're going to demand control of the entire island, and I'm going to want to fight you over it, or I'm going to demand control over the entire island, and you're going to want to fight me over it. We can't actually come up with an agreement in this range because we can't divide the island effectively. It's either got to be all mine or all yours. Now note that this sort of outcome is still going to be inefficient because we're fighting a war over it and I'm getting or one of us is getting this amount and the other one of us is getting this amount, but those amounts do not sum up to one. They're inefficient because we're still paying these costs. So this is a bad outcome for both of us because we are paying costs to fight a war and we are unable to come up with an agreement that would uh, satisfy both of us and actually suit us better than fighting a war and paying these unnecessary costs. And so there's a very difficult challenge when you're talking about issue and divisibility as a rationalist explanation for uh, as a rationalist explanation for war in that you have to be able to convince me that side payments won't work. What is a side payment? Well, bargaining usually takes place on many dimensions. It's usually not the case that we're only bargaining over control of one thing, for example, like the island that we've been talking about. So why can't one state buy the island from the other? 
Now, the example that I give here is in the Spanish-American War, at the end of the Spanish-American War, the United States controlled the Philippines, and Spain was still pretty upset about it and wasn't very happy and was thinking about still fighting over control over the, over the Philippines. And the way the United States and Spain resolved this issue is the United States wrote a check to Spain for millions of dollars. And the United States was essentially saying, all right, I understand you're still upset about this, but we can't really effectively bargain over the Philippines. We have to maintain control of it, and we don't really want to give all of it to you. So what we're going to do, Spain, is we're going to write you a check for millions and millions of dollars, and you're going to take that check, and you're going to go cash it, and you're going to be happy, and you're going to let this thing go. And so Spain did just that. Spain was happy to take that money rather than to, uh, rather than to continue fighting over control over this indivisible good and paying the costs of fighting as a result. So... In turn, we only say that war is rational in the case with indivisible issues if the value of that indivisible good or that indivisible issue is worth more than any possible side payment we can make. If the, the value of the good is really, really high, perhaps because it's a holy site, then those sorts of side payments aren't going to work. But if the, value, if the good is much less valuable, it's not like a holy site and there are things that we can use to sort of entice agreements out of each other, for example, by using money and creating these side payments where we're writing checks to one another, then that, that eliminates the, the necessary uh, issue of war and we don't really have to, to fight over it when bargaining is going to actually suit us better. So that is issue and divisibility in a nutshell. We tend to think that issue indivisibility isn't as good of an explanation for war because of the presence of side payments. So we tend to favor this preventative war example that we talked about in two lectures ago and the information problem that we talked about last lecture. Those tend to get much more play than this, this topic of issue indivisibility. But nevertheless, it's there and it's out there and it's at least a rationalist explanation for war in theory and so it's a good thing to know. All right, that wraps up this video. In the next video, we'll talk about another rationalist explanation for war that's less popular than the preventative war or information problem, but talk, gets talked about a lot in the press and in the media, and that's called preemptive war. And we'll talk about that in the next video. Join me then.